everyone and welcome to the grassroots economic organizing discussion of the food co-op film. We are happy to see you all and excited for your questions, comments, as well as your food co-op and solidarity dreams. GEO is a volunteer collective whose mission is to catalyze the development of cooperatives and alternative economic projects. We publish news about all kinds of cooperatives and other solidarity businesses and events to help educate people about possibilities and other ways to live. Our wish is that this discussion will catalyze or invoke higher thought and action on what we can do together to create what some say is impossible, a lifestyle where we all thrive and uplift each other as well as the planet. Before we get down to all the exciting thoughts that are bubbling in your heads, hearts, and minds about the Park Slope Food Co-op and other food co-ops that it inspired, and what the existence of this style of food co-op organizing might mean for us. I want to first say a special thank you to all of our panelists who are volunteering their time. And in one instance, sacrificing sleep because it's 1 a.m. in Paris, <laughs> had to come and share your ideas and opinions with you. We'll do introductions in a few minutes. We also wanted to thank everyone who helped us to get the word out and with a special thanks to Cheyenne Weber. Second, we want to ask you, our audience and participants to use the chat function to tell us about you, your city, country, organization, or your dreams for the world or your project or your neck of the woods. Third, we want to let you know that you may subscribe to GEO for free, if you wish, by going to geo.coop. We also see graphic artists and writers to show and tell the stories about what you all are doing to change the world in your city, state, or country. We hope that GEO is a place that you can come to read and see these stories and be inspired. Fourth, I want to let you know that this film showing, and thanks to you, Tom Booth, for bring us, bringing us this inspiring story. And this discussion is co-sponsored by the Cooperative Development Foundation, the nonprofit arm of the National Cooperative Business Association. CDF makes grants and loans to help cooperatives get started and grow both he here in the US and abroad. Also CDF trains local cooperative leaders and there are some here today and provides funding for research and education to advance the understanding of cooperatives. You can get more information by going to cdf.coop and thank you CDF. Now let's get this discussion rocking. To moderate this exchange of ideas and dreams, we have Lori Wayne, a former organic farmer, food hub founder, and current U.S. director of the nonprofit Open Food Network USA, which is part of a global community of techies, farmers, foodies, and good-hearted people who take care of an open source commons of software, knowledge, and connections made to support local food systems everywhere. Let's rock and roll, Lori. Thank you, Ajwa. That was, that was amazing. And uh, thank you everybody for coming tonight. I'm, uh, I'm Lori Wayne. I'm joining you from, um, the northern coast of California, which is current and traditional lands of the Wiat people. 
I'm a white, middle-aged plus uh, woman uh, wearing a dark shirt and a dark turtleneck. I go by she, her pronouns. That's, that's about as much as you need to know about me. I am so pleased to be moderating um, today and uh, I'm excited to shut up in a minute and let our amazing panelists uh, tell you their stories and respond to your questions. When you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box so they're a little bit easier for us to find than in the chat. Um, and we will get to you in order. We'll get to you as, as quickly as we can. Um, and we're also really hoping that our panelists uh, can have a conversation among themselves too. I think you'll find that the folks that are assembled here are an impressive crowd with a lot of different and very powerful per perspectives. Um, so just to kick it off, I'll, I'll introduce each of our panelists and um, with a very, very quick intro and um, panelists, if you could uh, let us know briefly sort of how you found the co-op world and what made you stay um, and what you're doing now. Um, uh, for, for our interest, uh, for the other panelists and also for the audience. And if you want to, you can uh, complete this sentence. Cooperatives are, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with Elizabeth. Elizabeth <laughs> Jesdale has worked for 22 years in a consumer owned natural food co-op in Vermont. In 2003, they unionized. And since then she's held lots of positions in the United Electric Radio and Machine Workers of America Local 255, proud union organizer from shop steward to Northeast region president. <clears throat> Elizabeth, can you tell us a little bit about how you found the co-op world and um, you know what you're doing now? Um, yeah, that's a big question. Um, I guess originally I found the co-op world uh, when I first moved to Burlington, Vermont, right after college. And my aunt took me to the Onion River Co-op. And um, I remember there were little signs on the shelves uh, anywhere that a product had sugar in it. There was a little sign explaining uh, about all the extraction of sugar, the extraction of labor and the land. And they had a surplus charge on anything that had sugar on it. And that just kind of sucked me in. Um, and I've been in doing co-ops ever since, but uh, more recently, as in year 2000, I moved to Vermont and um, I wanted to work, I wanted to be a core worker. I used to go to the co-op because there was a lot of parking and I always needed to go to the bathroom. So I would go and park. <laughs> um, and I wanted to be a core worker, but somehow my application got mixed up with the regular ones and they said they were only hiring full time. And I was like, okay, I'll just, whatever, I'll just do that. And I've been there for 22 years. So, um, <laughs> but it was, it, part of it was I wanted to work in an environment where I wasn't making money for rich people. And as a cook, uh, that's kind of what I do. And and I found working in a co-op, I'm still making money for rich people. And um, so it was that that brought me in and it's the union that's had me stay. And with that, I'll, I'll pass and thank you. Thanks, what an awesome story about the sugar. I had no idea. <laughs> um, ben Sandel uh, joins us from the land of the indigenous Suwon Algonquin and Haudenosaunee people, um, uh, also known as Harrisonburg, Virginia. And Ben's work is in governance, startup support for cooperatives, and capital raising. Ben, how did you find the co-op world, and uh, what are you doing these days? Um, so a long time ago, I had a six-month house-sitting job way out in the country, and 
I had a part-time job and the bookkeeper at that part-time job could kind of tell that I was spending perhaps too much time alone out there in the country and said, you know, you should stop by the co-op, which she was also on staff of, and, you know, you might like it. And so I did, that was Honest Weight Food Co-op about four locations mm. ago in Albany, New York. Um, the old building across from the Hibernian Club, if any of you were ever in there. Um, and a short story about that. So about 25 years later, I was working on starting the food co-op here where I live now, Friendly City Food Co-op. And I was... I needed to talk to somebody in the co-op world and I figured, all right, I'll call, you know, honest weight. Cause I was on, I was, I, you know, used to know people there. So at least I can say, Hey, I used to be a member there and I know people there. And it was that same person, the bookkeeper who answered the phone 25 years later, it was her last week before retiring. And, you know, so that was kind of amazing. Um, now I'm a consultant, have been for about the last 10 years. Um, and, you know, I work with a lot of mostly food co-ops, although I do, I've worked with other, with some uh, electric co-ops and also some just sort of, you know, uh, like um, health practitioner co-ops. And uh, really I'll, I'll work with pretty much any kind of co-op um, and once in a great while on the capital side, I work with nonprofits that seem to be doing something really worthwhile. Um, so yeah, that's, that's me. Awesome, thank you, Ben. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to present next Erin Dell McClelland. Erin um, is a mother, a healer, a community activist, a political strategist, and a cultural worker in Raleigh, North Carolina. She's the founding member and president at the Fertile Ground Food Cooperative in Southeast Raleigh, and the executive director of the Partnership Funds Funder Collaborative. Welcome, Erin. Please tell us a little bit about what brought you into the cooperative world and uh, what you're doing these days. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. I think I was born a cooperator. Um, I just deeply resonated and continue to resonate with the values. I learned about cooperatives as a member of an organization called Southern Partners Fund. It is a foundation that practices democratic philanthropy. It means that the members vote on who gets the money and the members are all organizers. And I got the opportunity to work with um, John Zippert and Carolyn Zippert, who are two of the founders of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives in Epps, Alabama. And I always found um, them to be as elders really smart and strategic in their thinking about building movement. Um, then some study of Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, Aphelia Randolph, um, du Bois, they were all cooperators and freedom fighters, particularly in the Black radical tradition. And um, I was inspired by their work and the desire to build organizations that focused on leadership and the developing of leaders over, um, the developing of leaders to govern the organizations themselves. I supported a lot of nonprofits and some of my organizing and was really frustrated um, by how nonprofit organizations model corporate corporate decision making, whereby you know the board at the top and the ED make all the decisions, even if they're in your community on behalf of your community members, and don't have to have community people directly involved in the decision making. And so that sort of work on behalf of instead of with community is something that I wanted to. Um, not model in my own work, <laughs> really wanted to model how do you uh, build leadership and share decision-making power. And I would just also say that um, the collective um, is, a, is an Afrocentric decision-making model. This idea that we sit around the circle and we decide together is part of, I think, um, is part of our culture and our DNA and cooperatives just naturally align with that as a, as a way of being. That's fantastic. Thank you and welcome, Erin. That's wonderful. Thank you guys um, for having me. Yeah. Next, I would love to introduce uh, Alan Berger. Uh, Alan has been a worker and a shopper at the Park Slope Co-op 
for the past 22 years. And he's, he's still doing it uh, in his wife's stead, in fact. Um, he founded the Brooklyn Free School in 2003 using democratic governance principles. And he's uh, I'm so pleased that he's joining us tonight. Alan, how did you um, sort of find the cooperative world and uh, what are you doing these days? Yeah, I don't have like a great origin story. A uh, friend of my sister's lived um, near the Park Slope Food Co-op and was a member for many years and always told us about it at family dinners and functions. And when I finally moved to Brooklyn in 2000, that was one of the first things I wanted to do. I went up and checked out the Park Slope Food Co-op, immediately got on the list to join and joined up. And I've just always been interested in alternative methods of organization and alternative ways of being. And, you know, you mentioned Brooklyn Free School, that's about as alternative as it gets, um, <laughs> where every kid has a vote to help run the school and there's no mandated curriculum, no homework, no tests, uh, based on the Summerhill model. Um, and also a few years ago, I ran the website Neighbor Goods, a good sharing service, part of the sharing economy. So another kind of alternative way of, you know, kind of helping us be, or helping us survive or get by or without, you know, uh, falling back on you know, the capitalist system. So uh, that's just a primary interest. Right now I'm back at my school working part-time as finance manager. So I was there, ran it for like 10 years, stepped away for a while, and just came back a few years ago. Awesome. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I'd like to, to next introduce uh, Suzette Snow Cobb. Um, Suzette has 30 years of experience working for cooperatives, with the most recent years being with the neighboring Food Co-op Association, which is a federation of 42 different co-ops and startups in the Northeast. Suzette, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, how you found the cooperative world and why you stuck around for so long, maybe, uh, and um, what you're doing these days? Sure, thanks. It's great to be here. Um, thanks for uh, the invite, too. I actually was unbelievably fortunate to um, have a course on cooperatives at Springfield College back in the um, early 80s. And the professor who uh, taught that course was, uh, it was part of a community development um, major track in, in, um, at Springfield College. And he was very jazzed about cooperatives and um, gave us the, the whole, um, structural setup and examples and was involved with uh, co-op formation in Central American countries at the time. And, um, and I remember uh, thinking like, uh, cause I knew that I wanted to do something in uh, community development or community engagement in some form. And I thought, wow, why, why isn't there more of this? And, you know, it was later that I found out that it's a rarity to have a, um, a course on cooperatives at a, at a you know, college level. And, and I also put together that, oh, this was um, as a teenager going with my father to the, the Boston Food Co-op and um, helping him pack raisins. And, and then a little later learning that my grandfather moved to, uh, and, uh, to Southbridge, Massachusetts to manage a cooperative dairy. And so, so there's been this interweaving of, of co-ops um, throughout my life, even without actually even knowing about it. Um, when we, when uh, we lived in, in Cambridge and I needed a job, I sought out the Cambridge Food Co-op and um, became a cashier that, well, was doing member work hours initially and then got a job there. And that uh, for the most part, through the years, um, we have, my family and I have sort of built where we've lived around our uh, connection to, to uh, 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 co-op um, 
co-op availability. And, and, so, and part of that was for um, having, you know, young children at the time um, was partially the food access, but also the community and, and the, again, the not, not wanting to work for someone that is going to be extracting from the community, but, and also not, and wanting to work um, uh, job-wise uh, to work to gain employment through uh, working for people rather than, you know, um, with people rather than just uh, for them. And so, and, and I think uh, one of the things that's, that's kept me involved through the years is the continuing uh, learning about different types of co-ops. I didn't really know much about worker co-ops. Um, uh, so I've taken opportunities to more formal and, and less formal to, to learn about different types of co-ops in the communities and what they mean to people. And, and I'm continually inspired by what people can do when they're coming together and, and working on um, uh, projects that they're, they're passionate about or that are in real need. And uh, so that's, you know, that's, that's what's led me to working now. Uh, I worked for uh, 20 years for the Franklin Community Co-op, which is in Western Massachusetts, Greenfield's Market and McCusker's Market, and was the co-general manager there for many of those years. And then, and during that time also helped uh, form and uh, found the neighboring food co-op association. And uh, when, so when there was an opportunity to work uh, uh, there, um, I took that opportunity. And so now, so it's been about five years um, that I've been, my title is sourcing coordinator, but I do um, multiple things for our co-ops and our co-ops are the members of our of our of our co-op federation. Fantastic, Suzette! Thank you so much for coming, and thank you for your decades of service to the co-op community. Um, I think I just have one more panelist to introduce you to, and that's uh, so the man of the hour in a way. And the hour is really really late. I think it's one a.m. in the city of light, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Mr. Tom Booth, um, Tom is our filmmaker and he's uh, joining us from Paris um, where it's super duper late. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we'll try to keep you uh, nice and awake. Um, and uh, in addition to making the film, uh, he also had a big part in creating La Louvre, which is a collaborative uh, supermarket that's based on the same uh, pattern and principles as the Park Slope Co-op. And we are so pleased uh, to have you here with us, Tom. Could you tell us a little bit about how you found your way into the co-op world from filmmaking school and um, what kind of uh, kept, you, kept you around and uh, what you're doing these, these days in Paris? Thanks a lot for inviting me on this panel. It's a real pleasure. Yeah, it is a little bit late, but it's like I said, I'm kind of a night owl, so this is this is all right. Um, well, I kind of feel like Aaron said. I don't. I don't. I feel like that always felt like not having. I'm from Indiana. I'm American from Indiana, and and um, I always felt like probably the things that in terms of businesses that I was involved you know, that I had to shop at were just wrong. You know what I mean? I was felt like, you know, where's, where's the right place? Um, I also ended up where, where I did my film studies was at Antioch College in Ohio, which is kind of a progressive small liberal arts college. I studied film, but I also studied um, food and wine with a really kind of amazing person who was kind of a pioneer in I don't know what they call popular education in French, but like trying to trying to make uh, trying to democratize very high quality aesthetic things. So that was a value I had. And then I lived my life, did a bunch of things, ended up in Paris. And I came back to visit some friends that were living in Brooklyn and they were members of the Park Slope Food Co-op. And when I went into that store, I thought, wow, this is the place in food that is actually doing that democratization of high quality, thing, uh, high quality food. 
in the sense that it was not just education, it was also the price. And that, that's the big blocking point for a lot of people. And so I, with a friend of mine here in Paris, we said, let's try to do that in this city. And to make a long story short, that was in 2009. And we opened La Louvre in 2016. And it's going pretty well. We've got about 4,000 active members currently. Um, and, you know, as, as you said, it's based exactly on the same principles as the Park Slope Food Club. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tom. And thank you, all the panelists. Um, I definitely noticed a couple of themes. One of them is that we, lots of, lots of folks have uh, powerful and wise teachers who um, led them into, into the work that they're pursuing now. Um, and also a couple of folks mentioned that this model is still pretty rare. And um, I'm interested in um, kind of uh, diving into that. Um, before I do ask a question for the panel, I'm, I just wanted to encourage you, if you're in the audience, we have one question, but if you have a question for the panelists, please uh, type it into the Q&A box and we'll do our best to make sure that question gets answered. Um, this is the part where I uh, start shutting up more. And I'd like to um, just kind of uh, float one question and whoever feels moved to, to chat about it on our panel, please sing out and let's see where it goes. Um, Kind of a kind of a big question that might have been on your mind when you're watching the movie um, is like, why aren't there more Park Slope food co-ops around? Um, what's you know what's the what's the deal? Is it what what's going on there? Any anybody want to bite that one off? I, I can say one thing to that having. Um... You know the the Louvre. It, so we're we're in kind of one of the poorest neighborhoods of of Paris, um, and it's been different than than was the case at least when I when I was more involved in the, when I was living in the states. I know that Park Slope got kind of a bad rap in the press, kind of to put it lightly, some sometimes and um, kind of different than that. We've had a huge you know everybody loves us in Paris. There's something something maybe in French mentality that doesn't have a problem with a basically a socialist supermarket, which maybe sometimes people have a problem with that in America. And so there've been a lot of people <clears throat> since we've opened our store here that have um, tried to do the same thing. We've tried to help them make co-ops like ours and it's very hard. And one of the things about this model, there, there's a bunch of difficult things, but one of the most complicated things is it seems to work at best at, at a supermarket size and not in a boutique size. And so that's that's hard in term for two reasons, I think. Sometimes people just don't want that. They would they like they think that's too big. They want it, they want a smaller shop. Um, and the other thing is that if you want to make, we have we have, I forget what square feet are, but we we have a 1,500 square meters. So it's, it's about the size of the Park Slope Food Co-op. So it's a pretty big place. That's total surface, not the, or total area, not the whole, not just selling space. And to get that kind of space um, is really difficult because it's really expensive. And so I think some of it, at least with the projects in France, some people are aware of that issue that um, the project, this kind of model works best in a, in a bigger space but they just don't have the access to the capital to get such a big space. And so that prevents them. And I'll, I'll just say just the logic in case it doesn't make sense to everybody of why this model is gonna work better in a supermarket than in a, in a smaller boutique form. It's the idea that if you ask people to come and work three hours a month, and then afterwards they can't do basically all of their shopping in that store, there's a beginning period, maybe just out of faithfulness, they're going to stick with the co-op. But at one point, they might have a tendency to leave. They might have a child or they might say, 
well, I'm shopping at another store, any place, any in any case. And so maybe maybe it's time to quit because I don't have enough time to do the work. So I think that's one one big reason, at least here in France. Other panelists, mm -hmm. any, anything well, to pitch in? That was my first thought too, was real estate. I mean, it's not just having the space, it's having a loading dock. I mean, in, in the film, watching people unload a truck on the street and um, roll things down and to, it appeared to go down into a basement, um, that's just not efficient. <laughs> and can lead to a lot of injuries for workers. Um, so that was kind of my first thought on that. And another thought is, um, you know, we don't learn about these things in school. We don't learn about these things in the media. We don't learn about these things um, through films or whatnot, or, or even our own communities. Being an American, you know, it's the wild west, it's, you know, be independent, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, all this stuff and get, getting along and sharing with people and trusting other people is, is unfortunately kind of foreign to us here. Um, so there's, there's a lot to learn. And, and those things also are an issue within the cooperative world. It's not like they've been resolved within the cooperative world at all, but um, at least starting point. Thank you. Yeah, other panelists, anybody want to pitch in? I'll throw in two that I think our US car culture does not help uh, makes it harder to start a co-op that's structured like Park Slope um, because, you know, in a, at least as I understand it and from watching the movie, and I, I did visit Park Slope Food Co-op once, although I didn't get past the door, um, but that uh, it can be really important. Well, like in my community, everybody, most pretty much everybody has a car and uses it regularly. So there isn't, there's, I think, a certain intentionality that can come when you don't have a car and you have to figure out how am I going to get myself and my goods from my home to my wherever I need them to be. And in the movie, the woman who had the two hour walk to subway to bus to get her groceries home, I mean, that's most Americans don't put up with that. They're not going to do that. And uh, the car culture makes it so easy to say, well, if my co-op isn't as convenient, I'm just going to go to, you know, I can go to my local grocery store and drive past the co-op, especially if they're going to require me to work at it. So I think the car culture has something to do with it too. Hmm. I guess I would also say, um, It's pretty fair to say that the model of uh, Park Slope as a as a food co-op has not been promoted or um, or or I mean it's it's really only in relatively recent um, history that that um, you know the last ten to fifteen years that that uh, we've had another wave of food startup food co-ops of of ones that are that are other types of, of food co-ops so and more recently we've had uh um an increase in in uh startups that are being worker consumer um uh membership so so it's almost so it's so the the park slope experience and that model has you know even amongst the the food co-op promotion has has not uh um had been done much, you know, it's in for who knows a variety of reasons, but also just awareness around uh, co-ops in general in the population as an mm. alternative. Mm. Yeah. And also, I guess I would also say that, you know, it's very, it's, it seems like it's um, 
it's fairly, people are fairly quick to say, um, oh, well, that's, you know, Park Slope, they're doing their thing, that's an anomaly, rather than actually looking at, you know, what goes into it, which is great, which is, you know, great about the, the film, because um, it really looks at a lot of, uh, of what goes into it. And it's not that, it's not that different per se from the, uh, from other food co-ops even, and not different from what I think people want in their lives too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ajua. Oh, you're on mute. My favorite um, line in the film is the older white guy on the bike at the end. Well, I don't know if it's the end, but part partway in that that film, where he says that we're probably going. This is the way that we're going to be able to eat if economic conditions get you know worse. This may be it for us. So I'm just wondering what people, what the panel might have thought about that point. Well, and also, uh, that's a great question. Also related to the previous question, there are legal hurdles too. And, you know, our co-ops all exist in this cutthroat, late stage capitalism world that uh, works actively against our kind of work, our kind of businesses. Um, so some of the legal, specifically the legal hurdle is it's really not, it would be very hard and in some places illegal to have a co-op that's open to the public, but that all the owners are required to work there. So the, one of the ways that Park Slope does it legally is they're not open to the public, they're only open to their members, which is fine. However, if you're not in a community that has the kind of population density and surrounding population, it's going to be really hard to make that work. Um, so I'm really rooting for you in Paris, Tom, because you've got population and population density. That's good. But, you know, again, in my community where we don't have that kind of population and that kind of population density, to have a co-op that isn't open to the public, you know, would cut out 55% of the current sales, potentially. I mean, we haven't tried it, but it's it's scary to even think about trying it. Um, yeah. Yeah. In seeing in seeing the the you know we've I've, we've helped along you know about fifty different projects have contacted it at least and we've at least had an initial conversation with them. That's from France, Spain, um, Germany now, a uh, little bit in in Belgium, and definitely it's not a it's not a model for small towns. There are, and it's also maybe not the the most important issue because we can thrive because in you know people are not going to starve in Paris if they don't come to our co-op but a lot of times in rural places the problem is there's not much food not much good places to get good food and so if you are the one place that has that in your community it would be a a more complicated question to to say oh we're gonna we're not going to be open to the to everyone in the public you have you have to have this work requirement so I think that I, I totally confirm that from our from our end of what we've seen here. Erin, a couple of folks have mentioned the um, challenge of real estate and capital and uh, the success of co-ops. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, funding models. And I know you're involved in uh, funding collaborative. Could you talk a little bit about that? Um. Yeah, I, I would say that I feel like for the majority of the funders that I have worked with in my uh, career, which started around 2000, that cooperatives are an unknown to them. Um, I'm familiar with civic engagement funders. Those are the ones that help get people out to vote and you know, they have direct service. They are taking care of like food, shelters and things like that. Majority actually money in philanthropy is going to more of a direct service than it is to go to social justice or racial justice organizations. And then sort of within that, the food co-op is like an unknown factor. And so some of my work has been really to press um, and push and raise the visibility of the cooperative model to organizations and to funders that give for community-based um, power building or community organizing, or even to help people run for office and to win elections. 
the importance about that is, and this is just general knowledge for folks that may not know, that a lot of get out the vote efforts are transactional. They show up in October, you know, and then once you get and then they're gone. And a co-op is one of the type of organization that's going to be in the community you know, 365 days a year. It's already doing community meetings. It's doing political, it should be, you know, put that out there. But, you know, our, our values say that you would be doing community education and engagement and political education. And so you're an anchor in your community. And what we want to do is see the anchors invested in to do all types of mutual aid and support. It strengthens the co-op, its ability to organize members and grow members, its ability to resource the efforts. And um, I think it strengthens the racial justice movement because then they have relationships with organizations that are anchors versus the kind of drop-in kind, or maybe the kind that, you know, for instance, a food bank, a lot of times is feeding people. It's not going to address why food insecurity is an issue necessarily. And so we have a lot of band-aiding issues that don't under they don't get to solving the actual problem that is um is creating the need for the band-aid in the first place. I at the partnership funds is a funding collaborative. It means that there are a number of funders that support our work. Um the Rockefeller Brothers Fund or General Services or the Ford Foundation. And we created a fund called the Collective Courage Fund. This was uh, named after a book by Jessica gordon Nimard, who's one of the advisors on this fund about the history of Black cooperative economic thought and practice. So we named our fund after her and our goal is to support Black-led food and land uh, cooperatives in their organizing power building, membership growth, membership development, and to try to provide that money as general operating grant. So we give out a grant of say $30,000 as a general operating grant, and then the co-op can um, allocate that money sort of according to what its need is. And we believe that doing that work with the co-op movement, and there are other co-op vote efforts that are out there. So we join sort of in that, in that realm. And I'm interested in connecting with anybody who's specifically doing that work. I'd love for you to hit me up in the chat or let me know. But we we feel I feel like there's a path. Um, and I'll, the last thing I'll say is that elections, you know, raise up to $40 billion a year. A TV ad costs a million dollars a week. And those things are used to persuade people to take an action for one day. And in cooperatives, we're trying to persuade people to take over the food systems in their community forever. And so um, I just feel like we have a really inspiring story. I feel like we have... Um, we're democratically governed. We practice almost somatic democracy in our actual existence. So it's different than say an effort to go encourage somebody to vote that isn't a cooperator. Like we already are, like we're like, so like, come on, like we're already well suited to do a lot of that kind of work. And um, and we live by those values. And I feel like that's, so that's one of the important, that's the importance of the funding collaborative work around collective courage that I do right now is just raising this, level of education for funders, but then also to help people see cooperatives as um, one of the uh, organizations. If we get to scale across the country and are aligned together, we could help to save our democracy, which is actually sort of under attack right now. We're one of those um, front lines and we just need to be supported so that we can um, more directly be a part of that work. Does that make sense to folks on the panel? You guys are shaking your head. Yeah, you understand what I'm saying. So, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're singing our song for sure. Yeah. And I did say, like I said, you know, it's so it's a thematic socialism. And I would also say like somatic it's in the bones of the co-op. We breathe and live democracy as we're organized to do that. And I think that the people practicing that in governing organizations in their in their everyday life will help to get them to see the importance of the overall democracy that, you know, we're all trying to um, be a part of, you know, strengthening. Fantastic, thank you, Erin. And Ajoa, I'm, uh, I wanted to make sure that your, your question um, didn't get uh, washed away with this like this beautiful river of ideas and perspectives. Do you feel like um, you got a response to your comment? Yeah, I think so. As you know, as much as we can, sort of address that. Yeah, awesome. Um, and thank you. We're, I'm gonna uh, 
bring it to the audience uh, for for a moment. We're getting some some awesome questions in the Q and A. I've, I've been able to find a couple in the chat, but there's a lot going on there. Um, and I I neglected to introduce uh, Josh, our um, our our tech um, superhero, who is kind of keeping an eye on things and. Uh, he'll also make sure that um, as much as possible, your questions are addressed. There are a number of questions right now in the chat about things like um, governments, uh, decision-making, conflict resolution within the co-op, like really the nuts and bolts of how Park Slope get things, gets things done. And also, a number of questions about, you know, how labor works within that structure. Um, and at least one person, Elizabeth, is very intrigued by your comment that you're still making rich people richer. So um, if you could maybe first uh, pitch in, this is maybe especially for um, Alan and, and Tom and others with an opinion like, how does, how does decision making work really day to day? Like, how do we practice that 365 democracy um, in models like Park Slope? Well, the, uh, you know, we've written a, that's one thing I should say to everybody who's participating is we have, you know, there, even before we started, you know, we opened in 2016. Some I saw a question. We're in the 18th arrondissement in uh, in Paris, which is kind of in the north northern part. Um, and so, even before, you know, before we opened, a lot of people, or there were many t uh, attempts to to imitate the Park Slope model in the states, also that failed because it is a difficult model to to make to make work. We, you know, Joe and Anne, Joe, who's the one of the founding members and is how now the general a general coordinator and Anne Herpel as well. Those are the two people we worked with, particularly at Park Slope. Um, when they came to visit us in Paris and saw that it was working pretty well, they said probably the reason that this one is working, a one big reason, is that we took a long time to study how it worked we spent about five years studying how it worked. We talked with Joe and Ann every week, like, um, you know, Skype at the time, you know, whatever. And, um, and so to, to really weed out what are the essential things and what are the things <clears throat> that are just particular to their local situation. And so we do have a document that we wrote with them that outlines what at that time, that was about 2013, Things are, have changed a little bit since the COVID crisis, um, but what what were the like essential things to do? The things that probably you need to put into place if the if a model like this is going to work. And one of us, you know, it has to be kind of a supermarket. Another one, which is particular to Park Slope and which really attracted me, is um, kind of pure democracy or pure openness in terms of what kind of food is sold. Sometimes there's a tendency when, when co-ops start, and I can, I can understand the reasoning to say, now that we're in charge, we're going to make sure that we only sell good food here or, you know, what we consider good food. And, um, and what we kind of in a mean way, we call those founders co-ops. Those are co-ops that, represent the food choices of the founders of the co-op. And when you're starting a food co-op of this model, we think it should be more like a public library. You're just setting up the structure that people can use to get the food that they need. And sometimes that the food that they need is gonna be stuff that you don't like. <laughs> so um, so that that stuff is available that we have written this into a document. So if people are interested in that, we, you know, we can we can provide that that information, but there's about there's about eight or ten ten points in that thing. But one and one of them is governance because that also we're, Park Slope's a big project, right? They have they're getting back up to you know I, they were up to eighteen thousand before COVID. They had a huge drop like all of our co-ops did, um, and then but they're rapidly building back up, and so I bet they're up to fourteen or fifteen thousand again, something like that. 
Um, and so it's a different kind of situation than a COP with 300 people. You're going to have a different kind of governance structure. And one thing that they really emphasized is that obviously it's always a dialogue between the staff, something we don't talk about all the time, but which is a really important part of the success at Park Slope and at the Louvre. It's the quality of the staff and the treatment of the staff. And, uh, and so basically they're the members and general assemblies decide on the big picture of the co-op, the, the big policies, like, you know, if ever we wanted to stop doing member labor, that would be something that would have to go to the members. If we ever wanted to buy a new building, that would be something that would have to go to the members it, for a vote. There's lots of discussions with members. But one part of the model, as they described it, is that, is that the the paid staff have a lot of autonomy on the things that they're responsible for in terms of decision-making power, right? They're transparent about it, but on operational decisions, um, they have they have a lot of decision-making power. Yeah, Ellen, any any perspective there for us about uh, from the inside? Um. Well, I mean, I was just thinking, I was put something in the chat, but it's not the kind of thing that Tom's talking about, and maybe I don't know if it exists, but a, um, it would be really good if there was like a startup kit for uh, food co-op founders or folks that are running food co-ops that are pretty small and they're just not able to get them to grow, um, where groups like Parks Love Food Co-op or others that have had some success could help um, help these guys along. Uh, I remember when I started Brooklyn Free School, I got a box from the school, Sudbury Valley School, that had been doing the same thing for 30 years. And it put together, they had a kind of a formula, like a franchise, where they opened other schools like theirs around the country. Uh, we didn't end up using their model exactly, but it was close enough where we were able to get a lot of good information and ideas from their startup kit that really helped us at the beginning. So I don't know if that exists, but it'd be something that'd be great to do. Yeah, it sounds well, like a bestseller. Let me just let me just say that we also we did just, you know, Europe is kind of a different place in the sense that one one we got the capital that we got for our store, for example, or the startup money, it was it was loan money, but there are institutions that have quite a bit of money that you know, we got a million and a half euros to start our co-op with no, ex we, were, we were nobody, we had no experience, we didn't have any track record, anything like that. Wow. Because there is, in France, there's a not-for-profit uh, financier that funds projects like that. Um, in the same way, we ju we've just gotten about 50,000 euros in grant money from the city of Paris and from a, a, a foundation that comes from the Danon fortune um to to um continue we've been doing it kind of in our free time anyway but to get a little bit more serious about um providing that kind of startup kit basically for people um so um you know if you if people are interested in that and i think joe and ann at park slope have kind of subcontracted that work to us because we wrote everything down they had all most you know they had the knowledge and would tell people anybody who wanted to, to to listen to them about it but we sat down and we kind of formalized it so we have a lot of documents that we can share with people a lot of them are in French but we've translated quite a, quite a few of them into English and so if you um, maybe the easiest way if you go to La Louvre L-O-U-V-E uh, if you type Louvre L-O-U-V-E and not Louvre which is the museum the big museum but, but Louvre and Paris you'll come across our our website and there's a contact um, email address there. I received the emails at that contact address so I, I can respond to you. Great, thank you, Tom. And I'm uh, just noticing in the chat that uh, our our community has, you know, is already growing and an incredible collection of resources for starting up co-ops. So that is uh, wonderful to see and please check it out. And I think uh, consolidating those resources would uh, would be really you know a useful thing to do. 
Um, so Elizabeth, I'd love to hear your take. You know, um, there was a, a, a comment about how important staff is, uh, high quality staff. Could you talk a little bit about um, the position of a, a paid staff member um, at a place like either a consumer co-op as you're in or a, the, a model like the Park Slope co-op? Yeah, um, I appreciate the question very much. Um, so I've been a, a worker uh, for 22 years at Hunger Mountain Co-op. When I started there, we were doing, you know, about $16,000 a day. I remember when we broke 20,000, oh my gosh, big deal, Christmas, woo, big, huge deal. Now we're doing between 60 and $70,000 a day. We're 26, 27,000 or million dollars a year business. Um, uh, when I started there, people didn't have computers. We actually talked to each other. I knew everybody's handwriting. Um, you know, we knew each other's names. We knew who had a dog, who had children, what town they lived in, all this stuff. Now, most of my coworker people come and go. It's it's just a totally different thing now. Um, not necessarily bad, just different. Um, I'm really curious because in the film, there was a moment when they were talking about chocolate bars. And I thought they were gonna break into a conversation about exploitation of workers and, and the food chain and all this stuff. And it didn't happen. And, um, but I'm so curious because where I work, it's a consumer co-op. We have about 10,000 members. Um, the capital city has about 10 or 11,000 people living there. Um, Sorry, I'm like getting a little nervous. <laughs> um, and I'm just really curious because we're pretty much like 99% worker labor and paid employees. And at Park Slope, there are paid employees, but I I'm just sort of curious, like how much of the labor that is and what do those folks do and how much of a voice do they actually have? I assume they're probably also members. Um, but in my experience working in a consumer co-op food co-op it's really not that much different than working anywhere else you know we have bosses if you're one minute late you get written up if you are one minute late more than once a year you go automatically to a step two I mean it's everything's discipline minded um and it's supposed to be corrective and not punitive but it tends to be punitive in nature and um sorry um could you repeat the question it's like just kind of nervous <laughs> oh yeah yeah um we're just thinking about how <clears throat> decisions are made um within a co-op to um encourage super high quality staff and um the role of staff yeah. in both a, a consumer co-op like your model and and the role of staff in uh, something like the Park Slope Co-op, which is mostly, um, you know, the member labor at a few okay. hours a month. And um, yeah, that's, okay. that I think was the general yeah. one. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I would say there's not a real emphasis on and where I work on having high quality staff, they're kind of looking for people who can work part time who aren't gonna absorb benefits and people who are gonna come and go because they don't wanna long-term people like me who are gonna suck up healthcare and wages. Um, in many ways, it's like working for Target or Walmart or McDonald's or Coca-Cola or wherever. Um, 
but I'm unionized, so I can say these things, but I'm a little nervous that one of my bosses might be on here. <laughs> um, so, but uh, I'm gonna have to pass, sorry. Okay, okay, let, yeah. Let me, let me, I'm sorry. Let me, I think oh, I, I will I, respond I, though to the, to yeah. the question in the chat about rich, me working and making rich people richer. There was a question about that. Um, and the way that is, you know, I'm stocking products on the shelf, like Mirror Glen and Celestial Seasonings and companies that, you know, corporate, corporate companies, I'm like putting these products on the shelf and I'm like, okay, great. So, you know, all the CEOs of these companies are making a ton of money and here I am, you know, putting it on the shelf and it's under the guise of this, you know, beautiful cooperative sheen of, you know, political justice and, and social justice and whatnot. Um, so there's that. And, and this year in our contract negotiations, I was on the bargaining team for our union and management, um, we were going over healthcare and they said, well, it's not fair, it's not equal. The way that the healthcare is being, because full-time people get healthcare at, uh, we, we did have healthcare at no premium and part-time people have to pay a premium and management saying it's not fair. And I was like, well, you know, y'all go home, upper management goes home to their $600,000 houses. And I work with people who work two or three jobs. Um, so if you wanna talk about fairness, then throw your wages back in the pot and let's divvy it up equally. Um, and that they actually left the room without responding with their, they wouldn't respond to that. Um, so that does exist in the cooperative world, um, unfortunately. And I, I would love to see a cooperative world that where there is economic, true economic justice. And that's one of the things that struck me about the film um, where I was thinking about, you know, people have to do their, their shifts, their labor shifts, but not everybody is shopping the same amount and buying the same amount. So those, their labor hours don't actually equate um, in savings. And that is really interesting to me on, on the kind of conversations that might take place amongst the member labor about what, is, what does equity look like? What does equality look like? What does I can, that I can, I can say a like? couple of things about, about yeah. a couple of those okay. issues. One, Thank you. Um, one a park slope, another part of the the ten points or whatever that that uh, they think are t essential to the model is is about some kind of equality among the staff, and um, and so they have we have at the Louvre we have twelve employees and we all have the same salary. We all have we're all managers. That's our policy. Is like if you get hired at the Louvre, you're a manager, and that's an official status uh, for countrywide work. What they call cadre, in in and so. That makes a great ambiance because no, but there are no stupid jealousies and no stupid, you know, power games about that kind of stuff. And we were inspired about that from Park Slope. They have 80 staff members. And so they do have, a, I, I think they have, they have basically, they have two pay tiers where they have um, a group of, I forget how many there are now, but at one point there were nine general general managers who do work a lot of hours, who are and um, are there in case of emergencies and stuff like that, and they're paid more. I think they're paid. Uh, this is I, I know pre-COVID uh, figures. They were paid about. Well, I can't do it in. I know hourly and yearly because it's two different rates. But basically, it's uh, it's less than twice as much as the as the rest of the staff. So there's two tiers. The, the nine basically ma top management and then everybody else gets the same wage you're compensated by seniority with uh longer vacation vacation paid vacation and 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 i think that is also an important thing in a model in a participative model because you know they have a big staff and so there are conflicts sometimes there's no problem you know that's inevitable but they really do have a cooperative spirit that i admire and I think it's important that the 
probably I think that the you have to have that cooperative spirit with the staff members because it sets the model for the members actually the way that the way that the it's a weird thing to have a hierarchy quite very hierarchical system among the staff and then ask for this equality among the member workers and I, I do think they've done a pretty good job about that and uh, Joe, even in one of our discussions, he said, he said, you know, you can kind of think of, and the more we work at the Louvre, the more we think this is, this is what it is, because, and it's a historical question as well, in terms of how staff are treated in consumer co-ops, um, that you have to think of it as a kind of a workers co-op within a consumers co-op, they cooperate, there, it's a partnership between the staff and 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 the working members and just i'll say one comment about equity in terms of working hours at park slope we uh, which is they um that did become an issue in terms of there was at the beginning when they opened they had um you could shop um uh and if it, so for example if you were in a household at the you know it was the 70s if you were in a household with a lot of roommates and a big family and all that kind of stuff you had to work three hours but if you were a single person you also had to work at the actually at the time it was five hours and since then they've had a in the 80s i believe it was they had a kind of a rebellion of single people basically who said that's not fair right i i'm probably generating less work for the co-op because I, as one person i eat less than a house full of you know, 10 people. And so they, they have a, they're pretty strict about this rule, though there's a lot of cheating if, at, at Park Slope, um, where if you are, for example, in a, if there are two, as a couple, you're in a, you're in a two adults in your household, um, you have six hours that you owe instead of three hours. Sounds like a, took a minute to get there. Um, I am interested. We we have a couple of uh, folks in the Q and A asking about um, the co-op members and noticing that um, you know they may be more sort of educated or articulate about uh, social issues um, that. You know, it's certainly uh, the prices are lower for folks and that's something that's a big draw. Um, but I'm wondering um, if in your observation, this is a question for anybody, if there's a particular like co-op co personality or a type of person, a uh, type of background, uh, a, a you know, something about a person that draws them to participate in a co-op and to shop and so on. Well, if, if nobody's going to say anything, I can say what I know about, about Park Slope one time did a, did a study in, in their particular model. And they do have a... Um, you know, economically speaking, that's quite it's quite diverse. You have quite Park Slope is a very rich city, rich neighborhood right now. When the, when it started, it wasn't at all. Um, but the thing that they did find is that um, most members were uh, pretty educated, it, in spite of their economic condition. That they could have been low income, educated, or higher income, but education was the common factor that they found. Um, I, I think that in our co op. I don't, I don't know. We haven't done that kind of study. We, you know, we do have, it is a pretty, just with our model, with the good prices, we, the, the kind of food that we propose is like what you find in a gourmet supermarket in Paris, which also includes kind of fine stuff that you would find in a regular supermarket. So we have lots, some, you know, we have the best cheeses in France, literally from the best, you know, producers of a given cheese. We have great organic fruits and vegetables. Um, but we also have, you know, kind of Dan and yogurts and, you know, that kind of stuff. But with a range of products like that, we do have 10% um, of our members receive welfare benefits, which is, there's nothing like that in Europe in terms of that, for that food that they're buying. 
And then there's another 15% um, that pay in installments, the, this, the uh, investment fee of 100 euros that you have to pay to join the co-op if you don't receive welfare benefits. And so we have, we have a quarter of our members who can't just you know, easily hand over 100 euros like that. Um, so that in terms of economic diversity, I, it's something I'm attracted to at the, at the park, in the park slope model. Alan, were you gonna pitch in? Yeah, I guess I was gonna say that um, <clears throat> I think such a big part of it is the, well, the, the people that go up generally tend to be people that uh, embrace alternatives of all different kinds. Um, so you've got people not just interested in alternatives in terms of food, but alternatives in terms of, you know, how they live every day, what they do for a living, what their interests are, um, the politics, et cetera. They're just much more highly represented in the Park So Food Co-op than in other organ any other organization I've been a part of. Um, and I think in terms of what draws people there as much as savings in terms of dollars, it's the quality of the food and the fact that the trust that you get because with members running the show, um, we are the ones that care, or, you know, we just trust that everybody is a member and that everyone is going to be buying and looking for the best food at the best price. I mean, you just, you just can't find that anywhere else. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Alan, Suzette. Yeah, I um I just uh, wanted to say uh, to answer that question. Um, I think the for our our food co-ops in general and uh, the 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 attraction is also yes wanting quality food yes uh, convenience is 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 a factor as well but it is also a factor of of the co-op once people understand um, that the co-op exists to to serve their communities and not and is not an extractive um, uh, 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 entity that that makes a difference to them so that they can see in and the better the job that the co-ops do in in letting people know that they are how much they contribute to the community in all different forms, making it really blatantly clear, the better off, you know, people can can understand that because we don't, for the most part, the vast majority of people have not grown up with any form of uh, cooperative enterprise or um, see it, or even understand what it means to be um, have empowerment through democracy. They don't. They don't see it in action. You know, the most school settings, most work settings. The so where do, where are they going to learn it? And um, and so the 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 more that we can help in those areas to educate them, you know, the more uh, beneficial it is for our cooperatives just by uh, from our cooperative identity. And you know, and and other folks, I think. Our food co-ops, I'd say, in the Northeast, but throughout the country too. But in the Northeast, are are working on being better representational of their of their communities, and and looking for ways to say, oh, who who are we missing in our community, and how can we um, adjust our product mix or adjust the people who work here to be to serve our communities more authentically. And you know uh, the healthy food access program with it through a needs based discount is one example that you know started um, actually city market and maybe hunger Martin mountain also might have ha had it in earlier days but the sharing um, of information amongst our co ops you know like how can you do this um, uh, this needs based discount and and you know, collectively, our, our co-ops uh, gave out uh, over a million in discounts to for needs-based discounts in the in the last in 2021 in one year. So so telling continuing to tell our story about how we can 
turn, you know, serve the community in multiple ways. Investing in our farms and and um, and food system is another big draw for people. There's a growing awareness about where does our food come from and how does it, how do we, you know, how do we support that? So I'll shut up about that. <laughs> That's excellent, Suzanne. I, I actually, now, now that we got you warmed up, I want to ask you another question. And a lot of folks in the chat and the Q&A are asking about how to make their co-op stronger, how they can help each other. And I know that you are part of an organization that's like designed to do that. I'd love to hear from you and also the other panelists about sort of how co-ops can help each other be successful and um, you know, learn from each other about what works or you know how things how things do well. We've seen a great example with the startup guides that we've seen a few of. And what are some of the other ways that co-ops are sort of helping to lift all the boats? Well, uh, I'd say also supporting other types of co-ops, like having an awareness of of oh, I'm going to buy my, when I have a choice to install the solar panels on my co-op's roof, am I going to use a, uh, a worker co-op? Am I going to source some products from other, um, you know, value added products? Can I, and, and, and also talk about that. You know, our, our co-ops have a range of um, reporting, you know, tracking and um, reporting abilities. I mean, most are getting a little more sophisticated, but, you know, knowing the, knowing the numbers about how much, you know, you purchase from, from uh, local or cooperatives or other co-op services, services and telling about that and sharing that. So the, you know, supporting the uh, co-op, joint co-op education in whatever way that you can for your, for your staff, for your, for your board, for your members. So, you know, hosting things like this uh, it, uh, I, is, is, a, is a great way to, to help people understand the impact that working together can, can have. Yeah, that's awesome. Other folks have, a, have any sort of opinions or examples of how that happens? I, I think consumers, consumer members of co-ops who are interested in moving this forward and, you know, they can actively talk about it to their friends and neighbors and bring it to their whatever, wherever they congregate, their sports teams and their associations and their places of worship or whatever, um, because that's really helpful, I think, just to hear, hey, I'm a part of a co-op and here's why. Um, also, I think we don't do a very good job, we being like the food co-op world, of helping people understand all the co-ops that are out there and that even though we're, you know, even though we're totally dominated by the kind of capitalist world, there are, you know, credit unions are cooperatives. Um, Ace Hardware is a form of a cooperative. So you have tons of choices in terms of, do I want to go to Lowe's, which is not a cooperative, or do I want to go to my local Ace Hardware? I'm lucky to live in a community where our Ace Hardware store is owned by the farmer's co-op. So it's kind of a, it has two layers of cooperation already built into it. Um, but yeah, definitely do your banking through a credit union. Um, that is really impactful to take your money out of banks and move it there um, and look for the products that come from cooperatives um, of which, you know, there's uh, products in every grocery store cooperative or not that are coming from farmers co-ops and um, other forms of co-ops. So, but a lot of folks just have no idea of that at all, you know, that uh, Land of Lakes is a farmer's co-op. Um, giant one, you know, doesn't look super cooperative from the outside, but it is in its own way. Um, so spreading that word, telling folks about it, encouraging folks to like take part, you know, it's the right thing to do for so many reasons. Um, and bring it to your friends, bring it to your neighbors. You know, I love, uh, 
when we're hosting folks for a meal and they say, oh, this is delicious. Like, yeah, that came from the co-op. All of that came from the co-op or from, you know, the front yard. But that's it's it's good to kind of, you know, make that. And it's been a part of it is one of the cooperative principles, education, training and information, which when that first started, it was more of teaching people to read. And then once they could read, teaching them about cooperation. And now it tends to more be like teaching about um, food and recipes and nutrition and things like that. But it, it, we can still do a lot. You know, co-ops used to have reading rooms that were places where people could go and read and learn. Um, that, of course, is really hard to do given the cost of real estate these days, et cetera, et cetera. But we can do, we need to do a much better job to spread the word and to get people to understand the value of the co-ops in their community. And, and to, as happened historically, I mean, you know, it's different, it's interesting in listening to this, this, um, everybody talking, it's fascinating. And in the sense that there was a comment of saying, somebody said that people, one thing that attracts people to co-ops is maybe is it's alternative it's an alternative, you know, into alternatives and things like that. And that is one thing that's a little bit different about living in, in Europe, I think, is up until the 1980s, cooperatives were a dominant force in, in consumer co-ops and in food and still are in some countries, you know, in Switzerland, the, the, it's a com competition between two big and very good co-ops for the for the who's the biggest in the market share in terms of in terms of in terms of uh, supermarkets in Italy it's very strong still England relatively strong in France not so good except in the southwest there's still a decent uh, cooperative chain called Coop Atlantique but one thing that really attached people you know we all know this or you know from the beginning it's a it's a project of a transformation of society not of eating better and so it's it's got to be, and so you know, co-ops need to make profits, in a, in a way. That's an important thing for them to do, so that they can invest those profits in their communities. And that is what one lifelong fidelity for generations of people in Europe, you know, in Paris. I've been studying this since I've gotten involved here in the in the cooperative movement and. You know the co-ops that in the in the Paris, city of Paris in the 19th century. You know what did they do with their their profits? They gave healthcare when healthcare didn't exist. They set up pharmacies when pharmacies didn't exist. It was the 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 you know the supermarket was the thing that was there to because everybody has to eat was the thing that was there to generate capital to transform the society in the way that we have to do it. And I think that that's uh, that's a mission that that you that you do those actions, and it, it you don't have to do so much talking because the uh, the actions will do that that talking for you. I mean, you know, we are we were do, we had pretty great profits when before the COVID. We're we're a little bit shakier. We're in totally fine financial shape, but it, we didn't, you know, we were looking forward to getting into that position where we had a couple of hundred thousand euros from our, our store to, to blow every year, you know, which we'd invest a lot of that into different things, but what we were planning to do and what we we'll hopefully do in a few years is we get together in one of the poorest neighborhoods in, in Paris with, with teach people who run schools, who are members of our co-op and all that kind of stuff and say, what do we need? You know what I mean? What What do we need with that? That is the best propaganda, you know, that could ever exist that worked for generations for consumer co-ops. Wow. What a, um, what a party that would be. We got a couple hundred grand. Uh, thank you, Tom. Aaron, did you have uh, something to pitch in? Yeah, I, I just want, I, I guess I'll build a little bit on what Tom is saying, and this is tied to the questions about how to help um, startup um, efforts, particularly those in um, communities of color, or even low wealth communities. I put in the chat, the Katali Restorative Economies Fund, and I just want to lift up um, one of the chat, one of the challenges facing our startup efforts is access to capital. 
and the cost of real estate going up and construction costs going up, even if we like, for instance, we've, we've gotten our, our, our place and now we're trying to build a strategy to develop our grocery store and the construction costs have exploded, which are really making it even less accessible to um, regular um, everyday communities. One of the challenges of not being able to access capital or accessing it as debt that won't be forgiven is that essentially what we're doing is burdening the communities that are closest to the pain with even more debt. And um, we all know that that's not a way to be able to liberate communities and to help folks build the systems and the infrastructures and the resources that they need. So I just wanted to lift up more restorative uh, programs or ways of accessing capital for low income communities to be able to build these efforts. It costs to develop the store, but it also costs to develop the people. And um, I think that we need to invest in sort of these reparative strategies. And I would even say, you know, strategies that lean into reparations. There's a reparations fund as well as reparations loan fund that has like a lower interest rates and, um, you know, the forgiveness um, processes are more lenient, et cetera, but more, more funds or resources for these efforts that are not extractive would go a long way towards helping to advance them as well as investing in, um, Pro programs that consolidate the efforts of these cooperatives. So for instance, Collective Courage is an example of that. I know the Food Co-op Initiative does a lot of that kind of work. The National Black Food and Justice Alliance, as well as convening Black cooperatives. And I know there are probably other entities that I may not know, be aware of, but to invest in what we would call them intermediaries. And sometimes people don't see the importance of intermediaries, but I would name that as another strategy because then we as co-ops can get together, we can learn from each other, we can pull our resources together and pull our strategies together instead of what I felt for many years as I was fighting as a co-op leader by myself. We have these individual efforts and we're all struggling versus coming together to strategize together and work together to lower the burden for all of us. So those are two of the thoughts I have about how to make it easier to advance these efforts. Fantastic. Thank you, Erin. We're, we're almost at time and I'm hoping panelists, can you stick around for a few more minutes? We've got a few questions. It'd be really great to, uh, to get your perspective on. Everybody, if you, if you have to leave, if it's because it's sunrise for you, uh, um, we understand, but I'd love to ask just a couple more questions that are in the chat and then do a, a quick sort of uh, takeaways um, question for each person. Um, so uh, uh, let's see, here's one from uh, Raul from the Community Grocery Co-op in Washington, DC, um, who says, with the need to include co-op members, the documentary showed how some members were excluded due to unhealthy co-op conduct. Um, so how can a young co-op establish these, establish measures to make a productive and healthy cooperative culture. And that, that can be for anybody. I would say empower the staff, empower every worker all the way up and down to handle situations and not have to go get a manager who then goes against what the staff person said enough of that, empower everybody to deal with situations straight up. Great, great. Uh, so uh, I think distributed, distributed power is, uh, seems to be a way to create the environment that we want to work in uh, economically and otherwise and socially and otherwise. Um, Let's see, so uh, here's, here's a question. Um, uh, I shop at a food co-op that doesn't require member work um, and it's prohibitively expensive uh, for most people in town. The Park Slope Food Co-op is affordable because of member work. Uh, if we have all the infrastructure, including a functioning store, do you think it's possible to convert to a model closer to Park Slope. Um, and and uh, I think that can, that can be a question too. There were a couple of people wondering about um, changing, changing their model to be more democratic. 
I, th I think it would, I mean, if, if you were going to change to a participative model, it would have to be from a kind of groundswell from the members. Otherwise, it, it wouldn't work. Um, I think it would be hard. I mean, once you set up, once you set up the habits of your, to just to, you know, to not have animosity and 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 bitterness with with even a small group of people, I think that would be a hard thing to do. I mean, that's one thing. You know, we we were really we're not very democratic in this when we set up our program and we encourage people in a certain sort of way not not to be in the sense that we say um, you have the right to say here's what we want to do. Our small group of people that are setting something up and not have it be something that changes all the time you know what i mean that 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 uh you know we have that you have the right to say this is the model that we'd like to establish if you're interested in doing an another model go go ahead and do that but those we've had co-ops here that have changed their identity trying to start up in the south one in the southwest of france that you know first it was only going to be organic and then it was going to be this and, and they end up they finish by alienating every single person in this in the city. Everybody hates them for one reason or another because they feel betrayed. <laughs> and so, and so you 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 need to you just stick, you know, stick to your principles a little bit. So I think it would be hard to to change halfway through. Though you know what could happen is you know one thing we're excited at just talking about where capital is and this we're just starting to get involved with this now. But we're we're just starting to meet the people who are kind of running these big billion dollar co-ops in Denmark and, you know, all this kind of, in Denmark, again, it's the number one supermarket in terms of market share, you know, and they, and they do good stuff with their, their money, you know, all that kind of stuff. But one thing that we're interested in is, is it's a possible, is it possible to have something that can attach it, something like Park Slope, or a participative model that's attached to their amazing infrastructure because they own their own distribution, right? That's the the great thing that you can achieve is that you, you your your distribution is also cooperative. And uh, is it possible for something that is, you know, while I really appreciate those things, they are quite institutionalized. It is more of a kind of a you know like a normal normal business in, in a certain sort of way. But is it possible to to hook into that? the resources of that, but with the kind of fresh energy of a, of a new startup co-op. And so I just say that in terms of like, when we're all looking for capital, talk to Europe, you know what I mean? In, in America, especially in, in, you know, lower income communities. I know that co-op Denmark is interested in helping cooperation in low income communities, you know, with their profits, which they make quite a few of, they're interested in that kind of thing. So those could be interesting conversations that could be had with those people. And if, if you get in touch with me, like I said, we're just starting to get involved, to chat with those, just have little conversations with those people. And, and, you know, because I mean, the way I see it, I mean, you know, the co-op movement, the consumer co-op movement in Europe succeeded in getting a lot of that capital democratized, right? It really did. And then there was a giant collapse in the 80s. And so we lost it. And so it's not a it's not a normal or fair position that citizens don't have capital, right? And so we have to find a solution where we're ambitious with it. I like what Aaron said at the beginning of like, we want to take over the whole thing, <laughs> right? We don't want to be little complementary um, things, you know, that are happy. You know, we we would like that back. To, in in our hands and so that that um you know you know somebody mentioned the the basque co-ops in spain also they you know i've never spoken with those people but they have they have money you know thanks tom yep uh just a couple more questions and we'll uh wrap on up but there is a question um for aaron uh, uh, how have the seed commons worked with you? Um, and um, can you can you give us uh, some uh, opinions about how self-help has worked with fertile ground, given um, how they've helped many other startups in North Carolina? So 
Oh, um, you're muted, Darren. There you go. Yeah, no. Um, I've not got the opportunity to work with C Commons, so I can start off there looking forward to developing that relationship. And then as it as it pertains to self-help, um answer that question we had some conversations with self-help about a site that didn't work out for us and they have articulated you know a desire to be supportive in the future I want to say that for we live in first I should say we live in Raleigh um, we're an effort that is a startup effort we don't have a store yet we're a black-led effort and um Raleigh is different than Durham the culture of our city is a little bit different and so I feel like for us, we've had to go I'll do a lot of work to prove that we're committed to the vision. And after organizing at this point in July will be 10 years of our organizing. We have over 700 owners, but that's not enough to open our store. And we also have had to do a lot of work to raise our own money. We have basically fought a lot of the way by ourselves for our effort. Now, what we have benefit from in the last few years is that there's a burgeoning movement of black led cooperatives all across the country. And um, recently, you know, for instance, Collective Courage, we received 56 applications from food and land co-ops across the country, all different types of models. So that was, so this movement is growing, but I feel like our effort to do an urban co-op in a low income majority black and brown community is a newer model. Hence, people don't necessarily believe in it um, as it would something in a white, wealthier community. That's just me being explicit. And we also have had efforts that opened and closed that were black led. And that has also challenged um, whether or not our pro our programs, our efforts can be feasible and, or will be feasible. And so, um, and, and the, I could just go on about the challenges of a startup model that's not in a suburban, upper middle class community. Um, so, you know, I feel like we we have to, we had to do a lot of work on our own to get to a point where we would be more feasible to folks or more, seem more real and to get that investment. And we've actually got a lot more support in some ways from, from entities outside of the state than from in the state in terms of financially. And um, that's something that we're working on overcoming now, but it's been a challenge for effort. And I think that for other um, startup efforts that are led by people of color, it is a real challenge to be seen as a viable strategy because the grocery store margin is small, costs are going up. Um, there have been some failures in um, stores that have opened in North Carolina and closed be there black. There's been two actually, two cooperative efforts that opened and closed in our state. And so we're working on um, you know, continuing to just sort of fight through what are a number of challenges to our efforts, but we're not, we're, you know, we're on the road. We've come along, we have a site, we, we've come a long way in our effort, but it's taken a lot of, a lot of work from folks. We started with eight people and $800. And so um, I'll just share that with folks. So I would just say we look forward for future support and to build relationships with some of the entities that were named is going to be important for us, especially the phase we're now at where we have an architect, et cetera, versus being a conversation, if that makes sense to people. Thank you, Erin. Um, gosh, we, we could, uh, we have, we have uh, plenty of questions and I'm just going to ask a few more. Um, uh, there's a, a question about uh, um, Park Slope's uh, employees, the staff, that there was a, an effort to unionize there. Does anybody know about that? Or anybody, anybody on the panel have info about that? Okay. Um, I don't know, but if any of them are here, you can reach out to me and I'd be happy to talk. <laughs> Perfect. Elizabeth is Elizabeth is the person. Um, another another cool question is uh, comes from Jackie, um, who is a business professor professor, and wondering how to get students um, interested in co op. So these are business students, business oriented college students. Uh, how do we get them to care or feel invested? And this, 
This may be a question too for Suzette. Uh, any tips on how to make it seem more relevant in their lives? How did your professor motivate general student interest? You said you were quite inspired by your professor. Well, you know, as in our ex experiences, you know, if there's some piece that you can connect with and if that mentor is enthusiastic and knowledgeable and, and, and engaging, there, there's that, that, you know, the, that rubs off in some way. But I think that, you know, the uh, University of Massachusetts has a, a certificate program on uh, cooperatives now, and we, uh, NFCA sometimes get, we, we get some, um, some interns and also um, uh, the Valley Alliance of Worker Co-ops, which is in our area, gets some interns through that program. And what we hear from them too, which is, is that uh, they, they are interested in particular areas, like maybe they're interested in, in food justice or they're interested in, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, writing, marketing or, or some graphic design even. And, but they're also interested in um, um, not working for a corporation. There's some, there's a movement to, uh, from some that are like thinking, how can I be useful, but also do have gainful employment, but also do good work too. And so catching, you know, helping to make those connections, like, oh, you're interested in whatever the topic is, it can be applied to, and, and you can find a place in, in a, in a co-op in some way. And so helping them make those connections, or maybe they're going to, you know, they, they want the, they have a little entrepreneurial spirit as well, but, but they don't necessarily want to uh, do it solely by themselves. And it's, you know, obviously it's not the worker co-op or other co-ops are not for everyone, but if they, if there is that connection with what they're already interested in, that's a good, um, uh, just learning about the alternative, that there's an alternative to being either a sole entrepreneur or working for a corporation or a nonprofit. Oh, thank you, Suzette. I also wanted to point out that Alan had a great suggestion in the chat, start a food co-op on campus. Really get people, you know, some on the ground um, experience. Uh, I'm, I'm getting ready to ask the kind of like a wrap up question. Uh, Ajwa, are there, a, is there a question or two that I should be asking before we go there? Not that I have. Cool. Um, there are, uh, there are still remaining questions and there always will be. And I've noticed that questions also, uh, have babies and there are other questions from other people. So. Um, as we just do our final checkout for the panel, um, I'd really appreciate it if you could just kind of say any takeaways or, um, you know, big important points that you'd like folks to remember from this evening and um, any resources or pointers or advice um, in general that you have for, for watchers and if you are interested in being contacted, um, any information about that. Um, and I'm just, I'll do it in the same order, I think, as I started. Uh, and that was, I started with Elizabeth. What, what are your takeaways? Thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you for having me. Um, Obviously, one of my takeaways is always talk to the workers. The workers know what's up. We're the ones interacting with customers. We're the ones interacting with the with the products. Um, and if you're interested in doing a startup co-op, come to one of our bigger co-ops and talk to the workers. People never ask us what we think. And, and the bosses will spend hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years, tens of thousands of dollars on consultants and whatnot. And I'm always like, you got the best consultants right downstairs, mm -hmm. the best you could ever ask for. Um, yeah, I, I always believe in the workers, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Fantastic, <laughs> wonderful. Thanks, Elizabeth. Ben, you're up. What's, any big takeaways, anything uh, 
you you wish you had had a, a chance to say that you didn't and uh do you have any tips for the audience um i'm just going to encourage folks i mean our co-ops especially in the u.s probably more so in the u.s than in europe exist in this incredibly hostile environment that is not about democracy democratization of capital it's not about uh you know, it's not very democratic at all, really, when you get down to it. And so we, I think we all have to, you know, that's a big part of the problem. Certainly getting capital is in ridiculously hard and it's by design. So the more we can work to uh, re-democratize our country, our society, vote for folks who are, you know, anti-capitalist when they can occasionally struggle onto a uh, uh, ballot um, and really start thinking and talking about that, I think. I, I, you know, I feel like sometimes when you talk about, well, what if we ended capitalism and then moved on to something better? It's, it can be a scary conversation I certainly, I understand that it's easier for like a white middle-class guy to talk about this than a lot of other people. Um, but we, we do need to start talking about what are we, how are we gonna replace capitalism with something that it actually works for people for a change? Um, and our co-ops are definitely doing that and our strong forces, but we're totally hamstrung by the fact that, you know, when we need to get money, we have to go to these primarily, you know, ultra, capitalist, ultra um, extractive organizations for money. Um, I will note it's been super gratifying working in the co-op world with capital in that I have found over and over again, these people, they're, super, they're very hard to find because they don't identify themselves as such, but they're basically saying, I don't want to put, I have intense wealth or immense wealth and I don't want to put it into the capitalist system. I want to do what I want to do with it. And I want to do what's good for people with it. So when you find those folks, you can do amazing things. It's just, again, those folks aren't putting up signs, uh, you know, <laughs> saying we'll finance alternative uh, model businesses, um, but yet they're out there. So we need to do more to bring those folks into the mainstream and to change our existing structures so they're, they work better for people. Here, here. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Aaron, um, takeaways for the evening or uh, tips, uh, information, resources to share? Um, I think it's going to offer encouragement about um, cooperatives is um, so important to building belonging in the economic system and in the democracy and in the community and in the food systems and that they are I, my uh, one of my mentors, his name is Saladin Muhammad. He founded Black Workers for Justice. He transitioned recently. May he rest in peace and power. Yeah, you know he's one of the founders of UE One Hundred and Fifty, and he talked a lot about you organize people into organizations that build power, like individuals running around randomly are not going to build power. They not as individuals. It's not actually a real thing that it's really to us together in these organizations. So the question has always been to me, like what kind of organization, Sala? And I just uh, really believe in cooperatives as a structure that can build for our communities forever, like legacy and, um, and belonging and care and that people should walk in the co-op and feel loved and you know Elizabeth like honored the workers honored and lifted up and you know uh, we the workers make the world go round you know and so just this the promise of the cooperatives just shift everything that's going on in our country I'm probably more of an idealist but there's no other way folks you know so if we gave them everything we could give them for the next 20 or 30 years the southern strategy was a 40 year strategy that brought us right to where we are so if we had a cooperative strategy for the next 40 years we we could we could heal and save so many lives you know so it's not it's abstract but it's actually not abstract it's real um, so i just wanted to offer that that's what encourages me and drives me as a cooperator Fantastic. Thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, Alan, any takeaways, any things 
You'd, you'd yeah. like us to remember Just what you remember? Just thinking back a little bit on what Aaron was saying about co-ops, believing in co-ops. I mean, I just think that so many of the co-ops that I've had experience with and been a member of over the years have been food co-ops. And I'd love to see the co-op model, like the Park Slope Food Co-op model or others that are successful, be duplicated into other aspects of society. I don't think that they're really in enough, anywhere near enough representation in society. I just hear about mostly as food, um, as credit unions, that's another big one. But other than that, like what about clothing? Why can't we have, you know, great co-ops for clothing? I mean, God, it could be, I'd love to see a really successful model based on the models we're doing and we're working at in another big field like that. I love that dream. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Suzette, what do you got for us? Any, any takeaways or final uh, words sure. of wisdom? Yeah, you know, um, I think, you know, watching the film was great. I've heard um, thing, you know, some, I've heard stories of, of Park Slope. And one of my takeaways from that, and also from uh, the more I learn about uh, different types of co-ops are um, that, we're, that we're more alike uh, than we are different. And so, you know, continuing to use our collective um, uh, networking and power to, to uh, make change is, is important be of our co because of our co-op identity in our, and, and, and so with that, you know, not for existing co-ops to not forget to prioritize and make space for co-op education, whatever form it might be, whether it's, it, you know, inviting folks from other co-ops to come and tell their story, supporting startups, having educational programs for staff and board and community and decision makers in your town or city, you know, invite them to co-op events, um, you know, continue to like, it's a, it's a constant um, spreading the word as, as this alternative that, or just a uh, way to go as a co-op model. And, and, um, and and um, I love the uh, the the concept of which I which I heard community wise in in Italy is that the co ops are looked at as as um, as their their uh, their community um, their community assets and and institutions. They're, it's it's a given rather than something that's an anomaly. And I'm sure that's the case in, in some of the other places that are mentioned. Um, it's like, so how can we shift the perception in general to be that our cooperatives are our community assets rather than just an anomaly? Love it. Yeah, we need a new default mode, huh? Um, let's see, uh, Tom, I, um, I guess I have an extra question for you too. Are you working on a film called La Louvre or not? I, I'm not working on a film called La Louvre. That, that's the same film as Park Slope. We do the same thing as them, just in a different language. Yeah. And, um, awesome. and, uh, but I am going to start working on another film that is going to be, um, it'll be a different kind of film. That, that the, the film about Park Slope is made in what we call kind of direct style, which is to say, I'm not, nobody's talking. We're just seeing things happen. So I'm going to make a, a, a documentary um, in the next couple of years about the history of, of traditional co-ops, non-participative co-ops in Europe, because it is an amazing story. And I think that's one thing that will inspire people, all that stuff that I was talking about. That's why I'm reading all these books about how, just what an, you know, unbelievable force for change and lots of things that we take for granted that the state takes care of now like healthcare in, in Europe not in America um you know they came from co-ops even the organization of of logistics in terms of transport it, it came from co-ops I mean we're the people who you know who rationalized you know in, in a good way transportation of food and all that kind of stuff and then it was taken away um, so doing that to hope that we can come to that because it's just like, you know, the thing at everybody at the Louvre, it was my thing at Park Slope as well. You're in a co-op that functions well for a little while and you're like, oh, this is normal. You, you realize that what you've been in before is aberrant 
it, that weird, the weird thing where you walk in and you're being marketed to and all that kind of garbage. It's just so obvious and so natural, but it's it's hard it's hard to do. Um, I'll just say a couple things from what the the comments that were that were said there. One thing, you know, there is a the the you know who Andre Gide is. You know, he's the uh, the author who writes about sexual liberation, all this kind of stuff. And and he had an uncle named Charles Gide, who was a dour Protestant. Uh, economist but who's also an important person in the in the uh, he was the, he was the french 19th century beginning of the 20th century french economist and they, they you know in france it's the république we're a, we're a republic which is you know kind of like a similar revolution to america but they've got the thing of egalité equality which is a great great thing that we've got got in, in the value system here in france even though we have got a million problems here in france um but so he had this uh, this dream that was the cooperative republic right he wanted to he wanted to build on the original idea of the french republic and that the natural transition would be a cooperative republic and he, he said that will happen in four stages <laughs> and he said the first thing is you take over ownership of your shop you start your shop and it's the people in your neighborhood who are the owners of it when you get enough of those shops together um you take over the distribution and and then you you that is become something that is not generating capital for people who don't need it right um, and you get more efficient you could you know all kinds of the good things then which happened in the cooperative movement then you move into production you know in the 1950s you bought cooperative umbrellas in co-ops in Europe you know what I mean that were made in in things that were owned by you as the shopper and the member of the cooperative store and the fourth stage that they never got to was land right then we buy land and uh and and the idea was like a guy that i talked to here who's run a, a really great not in participative co-op in, in in kind of middle of nowhere he says because the thing that people say about co-ops is that the great thing is that everybody's the owner and he said, I don't feel that one bit when I'm in my co-op. I feel the exact opposite. I feel like when I'm in a co-op, nobody is the owner. And that's the better thing, right? And you get into that kind of world. So that's, you know, that is the thing. We do want to get into clothes. We're starting at the Louvre. We just started a week ago, two weeks ago. Stuff we don't have room for in the store, we do in two-week flash sales via our website. So we just sell, we just did sales of like these really, really high quality knives, not made by slaves, you know, all that kind of stuff. But because our we they're basically half price because of our, our the way, you know, we have a 20% markup on our products. And, and so that's one way to do that. But, but I, I think for what I took from this very, very interesting and very thank you again for inviting me to this thing is that what I'm encouraged about, because I'd also heard about this co-op starting up in Dayton. Um, and I don't. I hope that, that that's going well next to where I went to to college in, in Yellow Springs. Is that the, the fact that there are co-ops starting in low-income communities? That's a great sign, and because that's where the co-op movement comes from. <laughs> it, it it comes from people trying to to get by, to 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 find a solution to live a dignified life, things like that. And, I think as much as and I, and again, like because you know, any in uh, European American cooperation that we can do, I'd be very happy happy to be involved in that. Um, but even between richer co-ops in in America and co-ops that are trying to start up, I'm sure that already exists. But that that will win for everybody if if the co-op movement takes out you know in lower income takes off in lower income communities. That's going to reflect on every co-op in America. So I think that's positive thing that I've heard from from tonight. All right, we've got a plan, it sounds like. Um, Ajwa, I am going to uh, pass off to you after I just express my That's gratitude right, one more time for both the amazing panel and our um, audience with their fantastic questions and uh, rapt, I'm sure, attention. Uh, Ajwa, take it away. All right, thank you so much to all the panelists for hanging in there. Um, 
you know, for two hours. Really appreciate it. The, the uh, recording will be available um, in about a week or so on YouTube and at geo.coop. We hope that you will, you know, sign up. Thank you.